Welcome to the Virtual Zoo, the channel that brings the zoo right to you. If you're from anywhere other than, well, the South, then you'd probably know that most of us up here just can't seem to get enough of that good old Florida sunshine. So for today's tour, we'll be heading back down to Tampa Bay to explore the ever so tropical Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. At the moment, the zoo is currently split into three main geographical realms, where you can experience the open savanna and forest of the second largest continent in Safari Africa, in the Ichuri Forest, their clear headliner respectively, the Florida Wildlife Center, and its vast collection of native species. But right now, we'll be staying near the entrance to explore the Asian Gardens, once the Asian Domain, and now known as simply Asia. The Gardens is a roughly two-acre temple-themed loop that immerses you in the jungles of tropical Asia. Built in 1988 during the times of the zoo's former master plan, it reopened to unveil this extensive collection of rare and intriguing Asian species. Though some of the exhibits aren't exactly up to modern standards, today's tour will focus on the animal aspects of the Asian gardens, including some that cannot be missed. And with that out of the way, let's begin. After you enter the park and head inside, we'll come to what's known as the Manatee Fountain, which not only acts as the main plaza, but directs us to our first stop. It's also worth mentioning that around here is the entrance to the zoo's free flight aviary, which I consider personally to be one of the better exhibits around here. But it all kicks off where the arch once was, and front and center is a kind of interesting laid out space, at one point was apparently home to rhinos, but now exhibiting the Malayan Tapir, a pachyderm native to Southeast Asia's Malayan Peninsula. Not only are they the only species of tapir outside of South America, but they are set apart by their distinctive black and white markings and their elongated snouts, which by the way all tapirs have, but these flexible noses are useful for plucking leaves from plants and scanning the forest floor for a bite to eat. Yet as fascinating as they are, and by the way we will talk about them in more depth soon, it's best to keep on moving. Across from this we'll come to a small viewing shelter and a look behind glass into the domain of the Komodo Dragon, easily the largest living species of lizard on the planet, growing up to a length of 9.8 feet and weighing around 150 pounds. These dragons, which are actually a type of monitor lizard, are feared for their aggressive demeanor. I guess part of that bad reputation is due to their poisonous saliva, which contains some fatal bacterias that will eventually cause their prey to succumb to infection. To the left of them, we can take a peek into the dragon's indoor quarters, but it's time to enter the second aviary of this tour, named uniquely, and I'm kidding here, the Lorikeet Landing. At around 2,800 square feet, the landing encourages you to spot the blue-faced honey eater and the namesake species, the green-naped lorikeet, a small and colorful parrot, a type of rainbow lorikeet from parts of Australia, Indonesia, New Guinea, and New Zealand. Here in Tampa, you can pay to feed them as they are commonly remarked as friendly and have been domesticated to make great pets. For those of you who aren't exactly fond of birds, you can view the aviary from outside, but the boardwalk continues to overlook a habitat for the Malayan tiger, in the past inhabited by both Bengal and white tigers. Anyways, the Malayan tiger is one of the more medium-sized of its kind, 
and similar to the Tapir, patrols the jungles of the Malaysian Peninsula, though some sources consider it to be very indistinguishable from the Indo-Chinese tiger. It's said that their black stripes actually help break up the cat's outline, thus allowing them to camouflage in dense vegetation. From there, they'll then stalk their prey, which includes deer, wild boars, tapir, and even young rhinos and elephants. However, they are currently listed as critically endangered due to poaching and habitat loss. Because of this, the Malaysian government has put certain laws in place to protect their national animal and stop domestic trade of specimens. Last I checked, Zoo Tampa was home to both a male and female and has even had some luck breeding the species as recently as 2016. As iconic as tigers are, we're just about ready to shine the spotlight on another rare and endangered species. Please welcome the Lowland Anoa, a small bovid from the Indonesian islands of Sulawesi and Bhutan, sometimes recognized as the dwarf buffalo. These guys only stand at about 35 inches at their shoulders and live a solitary lifestyle where they browse for plants in the understory. Since they are extremely rare and shy, not much is actually known about them, but what we do know is that they are hunted by some native peoples and face extreme challenges from habitat loss due to logging. When I filmed them in Tampa, I wasn't entirely sure if we'd ever see them again on these tours, but there are only a number of holders in the US. Then I later saw them in Miami, and eventually you will too. Now if we continue down the boardwalk, we'll stumble across another new species that I've yet to show you. This sizable space was once rotated between sloth bears, but is now solely foraged by the sun bear, the smallest living species of bear. They inhabit the forest of tropical Southeast Asia, and adults only weigh about 55 to 100 pounds. The sun bear gets its name from the orange to cream colored patch that lies on their chest. The small size of this bear, however, perfectly supports a semi-arboreal lifestyle and their stocky build and long curved claws allow them to climb high in search of beehives and fruits. Back on the ground, they can use these same claws to rip open termite and ant nests, from there slurping up the remains with their 8 to 10 inch long tongues. Sadly, much like almost everything we have seen so far, these bears face threats from habitat loss and fragmentation, as well as hunting for some Chinese medicines. Despite this, they are only considered vulnerable in the wild, but are somewhat rare to come by in American zoos. Next up, we're heading back to the island of Sulawesi as we enter another visitor accessible free flight aviary. I guess it's by no means a bad thing that the dense vegetation makes it incredibly hard to spot most of the inhabitants. After a bit of work, I was able to catch the Demoiso crane, a migratory bird of Eurosiberia characterized by their pure white plumes extending out from behind their eyes. The southern bald ibis of southern Africa, the Javan pond heron of the southeast Asian wetlands, the nene or Hawaiian goose, domesticated chickens, and some pond turtles. But these stars had to be the yellow-billed storks who hunt patiently wadding through shallow water with their beaks open periodically snatching at whatever comes their way, though they just happen to be found in East Africa and not Indonesia. Tucked away in this corner is a small fenced off space for the muntjac, sometimes known as the barking deer. As one can see here, males have short antlers while the females do not, though rather than headbutting like most other deer, Male munjacks will actually fight using their tusks, large downwards pointing teeth that can wound enemies when in battle. 
Phew, that was a lot for an aviary, but we're not quite done just about yet. The boardwalk then goes on for some time and takes us through a tunnel to a shaded part of the platform. This overlooks a large open space, home to the Indian rhinoceros. Now we've seen them before, but we've never exactly seen them like this. Male Johnny and female Jamie had multiple breeding attempts in the past, but it wasn't until September of 2021 that they finally resulted in a calf. Meet Baby Gronk. Though he isn't really much of a baby anymore, he weighed a mere 100 pounds after just two months, and was later named after Rob Gronkowski, star football player and tight end for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Baby Gronk was his father's first calf and his mother's fourth, and it should be noted that a group of rhinos is actually known as a crash. I guess a slight nod to football in general. Unlike the southern white rhinoceros, which Zoo Tampa also exhibits, the Indian or greater one-horned rhino is set apart by their armor-looking skin that protects from parasites and pests. Though he's well-grown by now, it's said that young rhinos will stay with their mothers for up to three years or until another calf is born. However, if you'd like to see him in person, I'd bet that he's bound to be transferred sometime soon, and you can even do so by signing up for the Rhino Encounter and Feeding, a paid experience that takes you behind the scenes in the Asian gardens to feed the rhinos. Following them, the cuteness is contrasted by a prehistoric appearance, a small riverbank that once displayed the tapirs, warty pigs, and even a deer, unveils another first for the channel, this time coming in the form of the Indian Gharial, a large crocodilian from the northern Indian subcontinent that averages about 15 feet in length. However, unlike other crocodilians, they are known for their distinctive elongated and narrow snouts lined with 110 pointed and interlocking teeth. These narrow snouts are especially adapted to catch fish, and gharials will hunt by striking quickly at their prey while in the water. Though no need to be startled, as the black and giant Asian pond turtles that live with them are off the menu. Despite their elegance, the Indian gharial is currently listed as critically endangered due to hunting for their skins. And it is estimated that there are less than 650 of them left in the wild. And by now, we're officially done with the boardwalk. Just past the exit ramp, and now to your right, is a small low fenced exhibit complete with a shelter for the Burmese mountain tortoise also known as the Asian forest tortoise. And yeah, they are a bit small at the moment, but these guys have a long way to go, as the Burmese mountain tortoise is the largest species of tortoise in mainland Asia. Just across from them, in a front-wired habitat, formerly exhibiting a clouded leopard for many years, I was lucky to spot the Binturong, known to some as a bear cat resembling a mix between both bears and cats, yet they are actually more closely related to verbidae, a family of cat-like species, including the fusa and many civets. Binturongs are a primarily nocturnal species that move slowly through the trees in search of fruits and berries, though they are technically omnivores and can eat some insects and fish. I say nocturnal, since they mainly sleep during the day, and it is incredibly rare to see them as active as I did here. The Binturong is equipped with padded paws and long claws that help them grasp branches. Much like the clouded leopards, their ankles can even rotate 180 degrees to allow them to grip the tree while climbing down head first. Found in Southeast Asia, they are one of only two carnivores to have a prehensile tail and supposedly smell like a fresh batch of popcorn 
due to a fancy sciencey compound making up part of their urine. When these guys joined the zoo in 2021, I do know they received both a male and female, as well as one of their grown offspring. So hopefully we'll see some bintlets around here sometime soon. To your right is a small dusty paddock with a fenced front, home to the Visayan warty pig, a medium sized boar like creature that resides in small groups, typically of four to six, in a few islands of the central Philippines. These guys get their name from the three pairs of fleshy warts on their heads, similar to that of a warthog. It's also said that their thick hair and small tusks serve as natural protection in fights between others of the same species. Rotating with them and next door, serving as our last stop, is a lush pit exhibiting another pig. We've seen them before, but it's the Babarusa, a species undoubtedly distinct due to the upwards and curving canine tusks that can be found on male specimens. But since what you're looking at here is a female, you can go ahead and click on that card above if you'd like to learn more about these tusks in the Babarusa. And that concludes this tour of the Asian Gardens. Though it might not be remarkable in terms of exhibitry, it's set apart and worth a visit due to the vast collection of rare species that are typically pretty hard to come by in zoos. Next time we're back in Lowry Park, we'll continue this journey to see more of what I mean by rare species in Zoo Tampa's very own Florida Wildlife Center. Till then, stay tuned, please subscribe, and thank you for watching the Virtual Zoo.